Hey guys, um, Malfunction here uh, from beautiful Whangarei. Today it's a bit rainy, clouded, and we've had a lot of rain and clouds this past couple of days, uh, which is good for the garden, which is good for the for the country, because we've um, early on in the start of the year we had a lot of drought, a lot of dryness, and uh, there's water shortages as well. All right, talk about shortages. Uh, spawn, spawn uh, number nine with the first introduction of Angela, who would later go on to become part of the MCU. But first, uh, it was written uh, by, um, written by, um, actually created by, let me just get to this. All right, so Angela was created by, um, by uh, author Neil Gaiman and artist Todd McFarlane. She first appeared as a supporting antagonist, uh, antagonist in McFarlane's creator own series Spawn, making her debut in issue number nine. As I've got here, this beautiful little, um, very, very mint cover, very near mint cover, um, copy, uh, in 1993, uh, and later started her own self-titled miniseries. She is an angel and a bounty hunter, working under auspices of heaven to oppose Spawn. Of course, we've been talking with, about Spawn for a bit here, uh, the last few, um, Cast uh, uh, live streams, and of course, um, my co um, co host who's not with us today, um, Rico, who's very busy working at his day job uh, from home. And he's a huge Spawn fan, he's a huge Todd McFarlane fan. And of course, I you know, I set up the Plunge Studios, uh, Plunge itself, uh, enterprises similar to the way that uh, Image Comics was set up. So, Spawn, as you know, is script co-created by, um, but created by um, Todd McFarlane, who just the last week or so uh, made over, to, um, around about, um, over a million dollars within um, 24 hours for his crowdfunding as a toys and re-release of his um, number one issue, which was really well because, I mean, he just blew everybody away and gave the whole mainstream comics a shake-up. Now, uh, Angela was uh, later the subject of a legal battle between McFarlane and Gaiman over the rights to the character, which Gaiman won. Gaiman later sold the rights of the, to the character to Marvel Comics, which, hey, you know, they put her into the, uh, into the MCU, uh, sorry, with, into the MC animation universe, uh, Marvel Comics animation universe in part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, where she's been sitting around in the comics for a while now. Now, she was integrated, as, as I said, into the 2013 Age of Ultron story, and her character was expanded upon the storyline um, story in 2014 in the original sin, she was, where she was established as Thor's sister, Law's, lost Thor's sister. Now, the history of um, her publication. In 1993, Todd McFarlane contracted Neil Gaiman with three other recognized authors, Alan Moore, Dave Sim, and Frank Miller to write one issue of his creator owned series Spawn, which was published by Image Comics. While doing so, Gaiman introduced the characters um, Angela, Cogliestro, and Medieval Spawn. All three characters are co-created and designed by McFarlane. As I mentioned, she was she first appeared in um, issue nine, right here. This beautiful little issue. This cover. This comic as an adversary. In 1994 and 1995, a three-issue Angela uh, limited series was published. I think I might have it somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, was published, written by Gaiman, and illustrated by Greg Capullo, in which Angela and Spawn were forced by circumstances to temporarily work together as allies. The series re was re uh, later reprinted as a trade paperback entitled Angela Trade Paperback. Re um, retitled as Spawn, Angel Angela's Hunt, in later printings, and given a new cover design. The monthly series, uh, Spawn series continued to feature all of the characters Gaiman had created long after his direct involvement had ended. Some characters had tie-ins with McFarlane's toy company, and Cog Cogliostro had a prominent role in the live-action movie in 1997. Angela would appear in um, Spawn 62, 89, 96, through to 100. And in 1995, a one-shot. She was also featured Featured several in several, sorry, she was featured in several crossovers. The Rage of Angels miniseries saw An Angela uh, greeting Glory and Angel, Angela and Glory, 
wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nope, that's, Ev sorry, that's Evangeline Angori. I thought I had that, An Angela Angori, but that was in 1996. And was continued in Youngblood number no. 6, 1996, and Team Youngblood 21. There was also a crossover called Aria and Angel Angela, I think I might have that one, in which she f featured in the series Aria. McFarlane initially agreed that um, Gaiman retained creator rights to the characters, but later claimed that Gaiman's work had been work for hire, and that McFarlane owned all of, and that McFarlane owned all of Gaiman's co-creations entirely, pointing to the legal ind ind indicia of Spawn uh, Number Nine. Let's see, um, where are we? Okay, I might have missed that. Okay, anyway, let's get to this. So, uh, right, um, okay. To the legal indicia of um, nine, uh, issue nine and the lack of legal contract setting otherwise, get, McFarland had also refused to pay Gaiman for the volumes of um, Gaiman's work that McFarlane republished and kept in print. In 2002, Gaiman filed suit and won a sizable judgment against McFarlane and Image Comics for the rights due any creator. All three creators were then equally co-owned, uh, characters were equally co-owned by both men. In 2012, uh, McFarlane and Gaiman settled their dispute and Gaiman was given all ownership. And what does he do? He turns around and gives it somebody, uh, gives it over to, sells it over to, to uh, two years later, I guess, to over to Marvel Comics. And of course, the, you know, I, I kind of wonder how much that was. And well, and we go on. Uh, so on twenty first of twenty uh, twenty first of March, well, oh, a couple of weeks back, twenty thirteen, uh, uh, comic book re resources. Um, it's confirmed that Neil Gaiman was returning to Marvel Comics and would bring Angela with him. Joe jo Caserta was quoted as saying her first appearance as a proper Marvel character would happen at the finale of Age of Ultron. So if you are looking to buy an Angela comic uh, in the, uh, as part of the MCU, get the last issue of Age of Ultron series. Bleeding Cool also later confirmed that Marvel had um, completely bought the rights to Angela from Gaiman. Uh, and then on 9th of May 2013, Entertainment Weekly published the first image of Angela as redesigned by Crusader for her appearances in books. So it's this is the thing about um, creator own ownership, right, of um, prob um, problems with, say, something like uh, with um, owning, you know, co-creating something with someone. And, you, um, and, I mean, it's part of a main, main, main line of comics. I mean, like, you know, to work for hire. So, you know, if you're working for hire, you don't really want to come up with the best of your work and put it in there and then later complain about it. So I, I'm sort of like, I'm awful creators, right? And I'm very particular about what we create at, at Plunge because I'm aware of all these issues. Um, the Kirby, the Stan Lee, uh, the, I think it's Jim Stalin, Stan Lee issues, all these different creators issues in the modern era. Uh, rest in peace, Stan Lee. Um, you know, great man of our, um, you know, putting putting comics out there. And for years, for decades of his life, nobody wanted to touch comics, but now everybody wants comics. Everybody wants a piece of this. Hollywood's coming for comics. And it's like, you know, so as the creator myself, I'm very particular about, I talk to my uh, co-creators about, hey, this is how much this is, is. I'm co-creating this with you, and this is how much you own. Because at the end of the day, I want to be very clear that what I own is what I own and what you co-own and co-own with me is what you own because that way it's all clear because we don't want legal battles later on. Um, you know, we can hash it out and talk about it now, you know, but also the other thing is that if you are a creator yourself, you got to be aware of all these different cases that are involving creator owned comics. And of course, Todd McFarlane, you know, I, I, you know, in a way, you know, I guess, you know, he was working that he, he co-created. So if you co-create, how much percentage? And right, and then so suddenly 
you know, everybody owns it, but then he's got to go back and battle over and say, okay, fine, give it over. And what happens? He goes and sells to somebody else, bigger money. So, you know, it's, it's all, at the end, when somebody does it, it's not about the, the ownership of the creator or how great the creation is or how, how much you have a passion for that work. It's basically was about money, right? And so whenever there's anything to do with money, there's going to be problems. So if you're working with co-creators, you know, do your due diligence. Do your due diligence. Or you're going to have that issue that's, that Todd McFarlane had. Hey, awesome, Todd. Two million, um, you know, around about almost $2 million. I mean, for New Zealand, $2 million within 24 hours, right? The guy knows how to do business and he knows what the industry needs. And that's, he's always been at the forefront of it and and i think you like i can't stress enough learn about the legal rights that you have as a creator and when you're going to be creating stuff for people or if you're going to co-create or if you're going to get other people on board if you're going to come up with design make sure that that you know you're putting as much effort into it as your co-creator is if you're coming up the artwork if you're coming up with the logo design uh, I'm very particular as a logo designer. I like things to look a certain way, and I will do it. I'll try many, many times. Sometimes probably about 30, 40 times before I agree. Uh, before I not agree. Before I decide that I'm happy with the design. Um, I mean, Incredible took me about seven, eight years before I came up with the, you know, the um, the the GI. It was really hard trying to come up with how do you put it? IG, sorry, Incredible IG as a logo that can be always recognized that can be hit, hit you in the face and get that's that right it's like um it's like the spider-man it's just the image and you already know it's spider-man or Sp superman right or batman it's just a batman logo and you already know it's batman so it's very important to do a very catchy very uh particular logo design um emblem i should say or and also the logo design so it's actually stands out from everybody else and also make sure you check there aren't others around like that all right i did a i did a um a design way back in 2002 2001 for a, uh, for one of our uh for a clothing line street wear that i was doing and i came out, spent three months coming up with this design while i was doing my business course and uh, i was like okay going through all this it was supposed to be a double f it was supposed to F logo and I turned it into double F, put out the, um, put out the logo, everything, put on clothing, paid for, uh, you know, uh, like t-shirt design labels, you know, t um, the labels at the back there, tags, I should say, uh, stickers, business cards, the works, even jean buttons. Went away to film school, came back, someone had taken it had basically taken the logo and slightly changed it and said, it's theirs now. Turned out it was the same industry that I was going to get into later. All right. I mean, same sort of stuff I was going to get into later. So I don't have to worry about, firstly, I said on the face of this, I was like, you know what? I will just leave it. Um, um, you know, I, try, I was going to fight it way back in 2000 and um, I think seven. And then I turned out it was going to cost me $10,000 to do that. And I decided, well, no, you know what? it's mine i made it if anybody wants to ever contest it they can try but i've got all the paperwork i've got all the all the thing right but this is what it comes to when you're designing stuff right when you're designing logos designing t-shirts design whatever put your trademark on it put your label on it put your signature on it i you know i've um i've asked for people to um send me some work on deviant art because i want to work on a sci-fi comic book if you're an artist out there if you're interested in working on a uh, on a crowdfunded um, print, um, crowdfunded project, that will last about a year, a year and a half, because it's 120, 30 pages of work. Hit me up, and and I've said to them, I said, look, put your put your uh, mark on it, you know, make it very visible, uh, because then I don't want you coming back to me later going, oh, I sent you some work, you to look at it, and you reuse it. I'm not going to reuse work, but of course people can accuse you of that. So it's very important to you know to be very aware of the legal status of as a creator so so you don't run into problems like this right you know where someone uh creates something for you for work for hire you're a co-creator then they decide what they want everything and then they go sell it off they don't even say you know 
they get a, they get money from you, they get money from somebody else because it's all about money. That's why I don't have respect for Neil Gaiman anymore. But that's me personally, right? Uh, I love Sandman. I love his um, you know death and all that sort of. But I, I have no respect. So when you're doing, you know, for me it feels like a work for hire that sort of thing. That, but here's the thing: be very clear when you're working with someone on a comic book, on a book, on co-creating, whatever. That's all I got to say about that. Know know your rights. Know their rights. Know what you're doing. Be very aware of things. If you don't know what you're doing, ask for uh, uh, go sit down with a lawyer, copyright lawyer, which is what I did um, early on. Uh, I think in 2018. I said, um, yeah, 2018. I sat down and I said, hey, um, I need some information about this. And so yeah, so I sat down with the lawyer and said, yeah, this this. Can you? What do you think about this contract? Yep. So be very very careful in the industry. I'm seeing a lot of people get, um, getting their art stolen and not getting credit for it. Even photographers are getting their work stolen, not getting credit for it. So, you know, be very careful about what you own, what you don't own. Don't use other people's work unless you have their permission. And, you know, in saying that, just treat people the way you want them to treat you. Don't, if you're going to co-create with something, somebody, have a good balance of who owns how much and what percentage, right? So if you're a creator and a writer of something, you've come up with an idea, then if you've got a co-creator coming to design something, be very, very clear and precise. And then you can work, have a good, good um, relationship because everybody knows how much they own of what. Um, right now I'm working with seven and, I'm, and I've got to, you know, go, well, what, how much are we going to deal with this? Are we talking thing thing? And at the end of the day, when you come up with something yourself, there's got to be a, some sort of like, how much do I own of this? Or, you know, when you own hundred percent, but how much, if I'm working with someone else, how much percentage of that work that they've done. So in partnership, know your rights, know their rights, and be very careful. Don't end up like Neil Gaiman. Don't end up like friggin' Alan Moore being ripped off forever, you know, and and other other creators out there. Uh, you know, it's not just those two big, those are two big names, but there are other creators out there. So just, you know, even as an indie creator, be aware of what you're doing and what other people expect of you in the way of payment or way of rights of creators' rights, you know, of what they've created and how much they own of it and so on. So there's not much more to say on that. I mean, um, you know, you've probably seen um, Angela in a new iteration on um, the Guardians of the Galaxy. I think there was a uh, there was a part, uh, let me see, she was an issue. I think it was Avengers Infinity, Infinity War Part 1 of Guardians of the Galaxy uh, animated series. So, yeah, uh, if you want to check out what she looks like now, recreated, redesigned by Jake Cassata. I actually, to be honest, I think this is the, this is awesome. She looks amazing in this, right? She just looks so amazing. It's like a total warrior in that. And that's, that's, that artwork's by McFarlane, right? So, yeah, so this is with, uh, number nine's worth a bit, uh, I think, you, if you can, if you're able to get it, but um, of course now they can't put her, in, um, it can't put her into any movies part of um, Spawn. So it's all she's owned totally by uh, Marvel Comics, and so you probably see her in Thor: Love and Thunder, maybe, or you know somewhere there. But in the end, you know, I guess um, it is what it is. And thanks for watching, guys. Just know your rights when it comes to creating stuff. And comics. Kakiteano, catch you soon.